Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's research talk. My name is Megan Sullivan, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Yale School of Environment. I'm also the research spotlight assistant for the Peabody Museum. And this is our graduate research spotlight series. Um, so we spotlight different graduate, graduate students who have done their research in connection with the museum's collections. And this is the type of talk that we are going to put on for you today. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get going with our uh, speaker today. We have disabled the chat function. Um, so you can use the Q&A to submit questions. The Q&A box should be in the bottom bar of your Zoom window. Um, and you can submit these questions during any time at the webinar, during the presentation. Um, we'll look through them and um, make sure to get to as many questions as possible. Um, we typically do receive many more questions than our presenters have time to answer. So we apologize in advance if we don't get to your question or all of the questions today on this call. Um, and finally, our program is being live captioned and you can turn on the captions usually in the bottom right on the bar in your Zoom window. So today we have um, a special treat from Daniel Smith Paredes and he's speaking for us. Um, Daniel is an evolutionary biologist who did his PhD research in the Yale Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. His work focuses on the evolutionary and developmental biology of musculature in land vertebrates. And his talk today explores how limbs have diversified among the descendants of vertebrate animals. So with that, I will pass it off to Daniel. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to start sharing my screen now. So yes, as Megan said, I'm going to tell you uh, about my research in the Yale Earth and Planetary Science Department, where I studied the evolution of the muscles that of the limbs. So, oops. so it can doesn't pass there. So. First, the, the first thing I want to do is to show you uh, well, a few pictures and give you a few names that maybe are going to be important for you to remember during this talk uh, as I speak about the different groups of vertebrates uh, so you don't get lost when I mention like reptiles, amphibians, amniotes, etc. So here I'm starting with this slide showing that reptiles together with mammals are termed amniotes. You can see here the different groups, main groups of reptiles, including crocodilians and birds, uh, the tuatara, snakes that are kind of lizard and lizards all are termed uh, lepidosaurs, and turtles, all these are reptiles. And reptiles, as I said, together with mammals here in the back, are called amniotes. And amniotes, together with amphibians, that you can see one here being predated by a bird, are, tell, are called tetrapods. So, here you see amphibians, which include frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians. Maybe those are a little uh, less known to you or limbless amphibians. And mammals include monotremes, like the echidna or the platypus that still lay eggs. And marsupials plus placental mammals are called therian, therian mammals. So this group of tetrapods uh, is closely related to a group of fish called Cercopterygian fish, which include lungfish and silicons, and like sister to this uh, group of Cercopterygian fishes, we have Actinopterygian fishes, like these more ancient Actinopterygian fishes, like the bichir, the gars, the paddlefish, and another group called the tilios that compri comprises most of the fishes that you can think of today. So here's another set of pictures of different kinds of uh, vertebrates. And you can see in this diagram how they are related to each other. Reptiles and mammals together, uh, forming amniotes are closely related to amphibians. Tetrapods are closely related to lungfish. Lungfish and uh, tetrapods are closely related to silicons and they are sister to uh, actinopterygians. So with that, I'm going to just start talking about my research proper. 
you can see here where the start uh, denotes that this is where limbs evolve. These are the animals that have proper limbs and all the other uh, vertebrates that I'm showing here in this diagram actually have fins. So with limbs, uh, when limbs evolved, uh, also evolved limb muscles. And when we see different groups of tetrapods, we can see that they move around in very different ways. All of them using these four limbs that they have, but they use them to fly, to jump, to run, or do other things. And one of the inter most interesting things for someone that studies evolutionary biology of these animals is that they do these different kinds of movements relying on homologous structures. Homology, the term that I'm introducing here, uh, means biological sameness that reflects the common origin of, particulars, of a particular structure found in organism sharing a common ancestor. So you can see here in this tree, all tetrapods share a common ancestor. All of them share the presence of four limbs and all of them have these muscles in the limbs that allow them to move. And we know that these muscles are homologous. And I started studying uh, how these muscles evolved and how they develop. And by, I started doing, uh, I started studying how they develop by getting embryos of different animals. For example, here I show you like a colony of lizards that provided us with eggs of geckos. We got alligator eggs, we got bird eggs, we got turtle eggs, we also got embryos of free mammals. And the protocols that we used, uh, it's called an immunofluorescence. We can uh, label different proteins that are particular to, part to specific tissues in these embryos. And we can label, for example, the skeleton, the developing skeleton, the developing nerves, the developing muscles in, for example, this alligator embryo. Then this, uh, these images are obtained in a confocal microscope. There's a special microscope that can take very thin slices of uh, images of these uh, stained embryos. And then we process these images with a particular software that allows us to segment in 3D all these different tissues. For example, just here, the muscles of the arm that you can see here, and we can color them and we can follow them across the, uh, the different stages of the arm. So here I'm showing you the arm of an alligator embryo. Yeah. And you can see some of the developing muscles here. So I'm going to go a little back in time during the development of vertebrates. I'm going to show you one particular set of structures that is very important for muscle development. You can see here, this is a very early chicken embryo. And you can see in this kind of wormy-like uh, embryo, what is going to become the different parts of the brain. This little thing here, this rod that is uh, labeled with 11 is the neural tube that is going to form this, the neural spine and the brain. And flanking that, you can see here labeled with five, these little blocks of tissue. These little blocks of tissue are developed in every vertebrate embryo and they are called somites. You can see them here in different embryos, different stages of human embryos. And they form these blocks that are sequentially formed alongside the, the length of the embryo. And they are going to become different tissues. They are going to form the vertebra. They are going to form parts of the ribs. They are going to form muscles of the body. All the muscles of the body behind the neck come from the somite. So from these somites, here we are seeing like a cut of a diagram section of an embryo. And from these somites, some cells are going to separate and migrate into the limbs when they start developing in an embryo. So in an embryo, like I showed you before, that looks like a little worm, in these part, specific parts of the body, limbs are going to start popping out and growing. And when this happens, some cells are going to invade these limbs and they are going to form one mass on the, up, on the upper portion of the limb and another mass of cells in the lower portion, like the dorsal and ventral portions of these limbs, and they are going to become muscles, masses. And you can see here uh, in this real image of a real embryo cut and, and stained for proteins that can allow us to see these masses that are expressing these cells. And you can see how this dorsal muscle mass and this ventral muscle mass are organizing in the 
developing limb of an early chicken embryo. So what we can do and what I did during my PhD was following the muscles that result, uh, the, that develop from these masses. You can see here in this sequence of uh, development of different stages of alligator embryos, how these masses are going to grow and they are going to split into the individual muscles of the arm. And here they are color coded. You can use these colors to more or less see, uh, follow where muscles are coming from because these masses are going to, as I said, grow and split. And these different splits, these different portions that we call divisions are going to uh, form in particular muscles. So here you can see, for example, in this view that a particular portion is going to give rise to muscles of the shoulder and this color in red, another in darker red is going to form some muscles of the back. So this orange portion of muscle is going to separate into uh, other subdivisions that are going to give rise to the triceps musculature, to the muscles that extend or, or lift our fingers. And on the other side, you, you have, we have some muscles that are going to uh, depress the, the, the hand, for example, or move to this movement in the chest. Here you can see it better, like the different divisions are going to give rise to these different muscles. And one thing that is important that we observed is that when these portions of muscles start separating, the, the separations coincide with where these nerves are passing. In the arm and in the leg, we have uh, this arrangement of nerves that are referred to as plexus. This, this, uh, these plexus are nerves that come individually separated, uh, some branches that come individually separated from the uh, neural tube and they're going to join around the level of the base of the arm, and then they are going to split again into different branches. And where these, mass, uh, these nerves are separating, we can see that they are just cutting through these portions of muscle. And uh, this might be important for how, this actually might be important for how these muscles are cleaving. Another thing that was important that we didn't know before is that when we compare different species of amniotes like mice, lizards, alligator, birds, or turtles, we see that in all these embryos, the muscles of the arm separate in the same divisions. All of them, all these species have the, the same divisions. And this allows us to say, for example, this muscle is coming from this division. In, in, in another species, a muscle with the same name is coming from another division. We can not really say, we, we don't have a sustained for saying that these muscles are actually the same muscle in evolutionary terms. So we use these to follow different muscles and uh, try to unravel their evolutionary history. For example, when we focus in birds, we can see that birds are have their own very particular anatomy. And one set of muscles that is very important for birds are the muscles that allow them to fly. When we see, for example, this drawing of a parrot, we see that they have this very big breast muscle. And for those of you that eat chicken, you can see that sometimes maybe you notice that underneath the bigger breast muscle, there is another one. So these two muscles, the pectoralis muscle, this is the most superficial, and the subracoracoideus muscle is the more profound, the one that is deeper in the, in the chest. And they have this opposed uh, roles. The pectoralis muscle, when it contracts, makes the wing go down, while the subragoragoideus muscle, when it contracts, makes the wing go up. But when we see how this muscle develops compared to an alligator or another reptile, we see that it there, there are a little some some very few differences. You can see here in an alligator that this muscle that is colored here in light green, is kind of small and remains located in the ventral or in the like this portion of the, of the shoulder. While in the bird, it curves around the shoulder region and then inserts in the upper portion of the humerus. And this is what we see in birds. In birds, they have this unique uh, muscle anatomy for this, for this particular muscle that allows them to do this, this movement. However, most of the other muscles that we see in birds are very similar and to, to those of other reptiles. Like we, when we see the specializations for flying, we can see that this, uh, 
most of the muscles are actually very similar, but only a few muscles like the supraglagoideus have uh, these unique developmental trajectories, as we can say. However, when we look at mammal development, when we, we see how the muscles of mice develop, we can see that it's very, very different. For example, the shoulder mass, some of the shoulder muscles, shoulder muscles in the mammals actually come from this portion of light green muscles that I showed you in the reptiles. So actually some muscles that you have in your shoulder are, are the same, are deriving from muscles that reptiles had in their, in their chest. And we can see that these two muscles that are around the, the shoulder blade and also a few muscles that are called the parts of the deltoid derive from this reptilian chest muscle. Another difference in the development of mammals is that the dorsal hand muscles, the one that would allow a reptile to lift the fingers, actually do not develop in, in mammals. As you can see here, all, rep, all reptiles have a set of muscles in the upper part of the hand that are going to allow them to move the fingers up and down, up, not down, but they do not develop in mammals. Another main difference is that some muscles of the hand, of the ventral part of the hand, in mammals move away from the hand and they end up being part of the muscles in the forearm. And this is something that doesn't happen in reptiles. And additionally, some muscles that develop in the ventral, in the palm of the hand, in mammals are going to squeeze in between the bones of the hand and they are going to end up being muscles that locate, they look like they are in the dorsal part of the hand, but actually they are originating from the most ventral portion of the hand. So with this, we can actually say that if a crocodile would be able to play the piano, they would be actually using uh, very different muscles than the ones that we are using. Even though they have common origins, the organization of these muscles is completely different. And another thing that we uh, found out is that all these difference, all these uh, unique aspects of mammal uh, muscle anatomy evolved only in mammals. Early, early mammal-like reptiles that were more originating the, the line that gave us to mammals actually had a muscle anatomies that were more similar to that, those of early reptiles. So reptiles nowadays are developing more like their ancestors and mammals actually did something completely different. Uh, we also looked at the develop, development of the leg. Here I'm showing you the developing muscles of the leg of an alligator. And just as I showed you for the arm, uh, we can see that different portions of these muscle masses are going to be splitting and we can follow them. We can color code them and, and follow them. And when we compare across different uh, amniotes, we see that they are following more or less the same pat uh, patterns and they are splitting in the same divisions across all the taxa that we studied. So I'm going to tell you the story of only a couple of muscles that are uh, interesting. Here you can see the development of two muscle portions in an alligator embryo. And I can show you, I can say, uh, sorry. So, the caudofemoral division is the most posterior division of the ventral musculature of the leg, and it's labeled here in dark green. And the iliofibular division is the most posterior one of the dorsal musculature of the leg, and is shown here in light orange. In the adult reptile, like an alligator, maybe a, an early dinosaur, non-avian dinosaur, and a lizard, the caudofemoralis is the principal retractor of the femur. It, does, it means that it's the muscle that has the main task of pulling the femur backwards. While the iliofibularis muscle that derives from this iliofibular division is a thin muscle and uh, its role is more lifting the tip of the leg. When we see an alligator walking, the movement, back, the backward movement of the femur is controlled by this big muscle and the lifting of the, more, the tip of the leg when the leg is coming back, uh, is due to the action of the smaller muscle. Interestingly, birds walk and run uh, and move around very differently from alligator. In alligator, the main driver of forward movement is the uh, retraction of the femur when the femur goes back. But in birds, so you can see here, what you see moving and pulling the leg backwards actually is not the femur, it's this portion, the tibia and the fibula. 
the femur remains more or less static, doesn't move that much, and is not responsible for the propulsion, forward propulsion, propulsion of the of the bird. And consequently, some of these muscles, like the femoralis, doesn't play a role in an important role in the locomotion of birds. And in the evolution of birds, actually, the tail grew shorter and shorter up to the modern birds where the tail is very reduced. And as this, the caudofemoralis muscle that we can see here being a very big muscle in the alligator reduced and is even lost in some birds. And in mammals, the tail also does not play a propulsion role. You, we can see here in a cheetah or even a human that the tail is not a big, humans don't even have tails, but it's not a big structure and doesn't house muscles that are going to be moving the, the body forward. A unique group of muscles involving the femor femoral, femoral retraction in mammals are the glutes. And the glutes are three different muscles. They are very big. In humans, they are particularly big because they also play a role in maintaining our erect posture. And when we see the development of mammals, we can see that the mammalian caudofemoralis is very reduced. And the iliofibularis division, the, the portion that will give rise to this thin muscle in an alligator, is expanded and originates the glutes. So the, the, all the gluteal muscles in mammals actually are related, derived from this reptilian thin muscle that was whose role was to lift the leg. And now they are in charge of moving the femur backwards and propulsing the, the forward movement. So here we can see again a different view of this. We can see in the mouse how these muscles are very big and these remnants of the caudofemoral division are actually very small and they are just uh, fulfilling this stabilizing role. And when we see the, the, the fossil record of mammals, we can say we can see that in the earliest synapses, the earliest uh, amniotes that were part of the line of uh, giving rise to mammals, they look very reptilian and they had these big tails that probably house a big caudofemoralis uh, muscle. So they were probably moving like reptiles. But at some point, this tail reduced and eventually they re-elongated but with a completely different shape. And this tail is no longer housing any muscle. So we can see that around some point in, in here, there was a transition from moving with a strong caudofemoral extension of the femur into an iliofibular or gluteal extension of the femur. And we have to look in fossils to see if there are uh, clues of when this transition happened. So here as a mode of uh, like a graphical abstract, we can see that crocodiles and lizards, uh, they retain the ancestral mode of locomotion shared by both uh, early synapsids and reptiles, while birds modify that on their own way. The, the tail reduced dramatically. In turtles is another story, but turtles, the, the caudofemoral mus musculature doesn't move the femur and actually helps the tail go forward to kind of cover the back entrance of the, of the shell. And in mammals, this uh, thin muscle, the iliofibularis, expanded and gave rise to the glutes. And as the tail became less and less important, completely irrelevant in uh, locomotion, it disallowed it to gain different functions, including signaling, balance, as you can see here and here, signaling like in a deer, fly swabbing like uh, in, in a zebra, uh, or even be reduced or completely non-functional like in humans. By losing its role in locomotion, the tail of mammals was free to evolve into these many different uh, Thing. So by now, just to end, we, you might be asking yourself what is going on with amphibians. I said I was going to speak about them, and I haven't said anything. So we looked at the development of amphibians uh, compared to that of amniotes, and uh, the thing is that they are very different. So as I mentioned before, like in amniotes, we have these dorsal and ventral uh, muscle masses that are going to grow and separate into individual muscles. But when we look at an amphibian like this salamander, we can see that muscles are appearing individually and they are not connected to previous to muscles that develop in previous stages. So you can see here, these two muscles in red are not connected to the following muscles in red developing in the arm. And here you can see it even bigger, like you can 
all of these muscles, they, they, they don't form these masses of muscle tissue. So the question is what happens? What happens in amphibians? And also what was the ancestral condition for tetrapods as a, as a, as a group? So we look at fishes like uh, actinopteridian fishes like the bichir and the gar to see if they gave us some clues about how the development of muscles occurred in other vertebrates. And the thing is that both in the bichir and the gar we have in the earlier stages of fin development, we have that there is a dorsal and a ventral mass of muscle that is going to grow and also separate into individual muscles. In fish, they have a way less muscles than in a tetrapod, but we can see that the development of these muscles is more similar to that of amniotes than to what we see in amphibia. And with this, this uh, leaves us with a lot of questions, what is going on in amphibians, but also what is going on in other uh, sarcopterygian fishes like the langfish or the silica. And knowing what's going on here in these nodes that I'm pointing here, it's important to know what was happening in the fin to limb transition, what was happening when sarcopterygian fishes emerged from the land, they developed the unevolved limbs, and they started walking around on land because we don't really know if they, they were developing like amphibians or like amniotes at that time. So in order to understand better what happened in this transition, we have to better investigate what's going on with all these other sarcopterygian groups. And with this, well, I would like to uh, finish by saying that comparative developmental anatomy uh, can help clarifying homologies across different taxa, it really improves our understanding of how uh, specific evolutionary transitions happened, happened, unveils remarkable and seen anatomical differences, raises new interesting questions, and also it provides cool um, things to say to break the ice at a party or tell your friends and family, like, hey, did you know that your butt muscles actually used to lift the leg of a reptile ancestor or something like that? And maybe more important is that this kind of uh, research uh, gives us some other questions that are, for example, how do these developmental changes, the things that we see happening in the embryo, correlate with the evolution of these new forms of moving around that different animals evolve? So how they have further allowed the evolution of other new anatomies. For example, the, the reduction of the tail allowed the tail to do something else. And these kind of questions sometimes in evolutionary biology look like we are asking ourselves what. Uh, first, the egg or the chicken, like what happened first? Did the muscles change in development and then the animals started moving differently or they started moving differently and then development changed? What followed what? With that, I would like to thank uh, the Yale Earth and Planetary Sciences, the Yale University, Yale University in general, uh, the Yale Institute for Biospheric uh, Studies and the Peabody Natural Museum of Natural History. And uh, thank you. And maybe now there are some questions. Hi, Daniel. Great talk. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned a lot about the different um, limbs and how they evolved in all these different types of animals. Um, the first question that I had was um, if you could tell us a little bit more about those confocal images that they're like the rainbow color one um, and I just thought those were really beautiful images and I was wondering you know how you how you took those images and what the process was like for that um, yeah. sure so let me share my screen again maybe here So, yes, so here, when we get an embryo, yeah. in, this, in this case, a, an embryo of an alligator, and we use the different antibodies that are going to recognize individual proteins that are expressed in these different tissues. For example, a particular protein that is called SOX9 that is expressed in all these 
uh, early skeletal uh, tissue cells. Each cell in this uh, early skeleton tissue is going to be expressing this protein. Or for example, this other protein called neurofilament is going to be expressed in the axons of different neurons. Or myosin is a protein that is expressed in muscle cells, et cetera. We can, there are many proteins for targeting uh, different tissues. And we use these antibodies that are labeled with a, not, with a protein that fluoresces. So when excited with a particular light, this protein that is tagged to the antibody is going to just uh, reflect another wavelength that we can uh, image with this particular microscope. And this microscope is not only going to uh, detect this fluorescence, but also is going to take very thin pictures, like a sequence of very thin pictures from the top of the embryo to the bottom of the embryo. And each of these uh, pictures slices are going to, is going to be like 1,000th of a millimeter or something like that, three thousandths of a millimeter. Mm -hmm. And then we can get all these pictures from top to bottom in a program and the program is going to reconstruct them. And we are going to have this kind of 3D looking to 2D image, but then we can put the files of this image into another program that is used to reconstruct uh, volumes and we can make it 3D actually. And we can go into okay. this program, we can rotate it and we can see how these different muscles, for example, are uh, organized in, in 3D. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks, that just looks like such an intricate process. Um, did it take a long time to make those? Uh, yeah. Yeah, each, okay. like, each, each of these embryos is like a three or four weeks of work. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know it looks like it. Um, we have some questions coming in from the audience members right now. Um, Krista asks, is the story of hind limb muscle change and tail loss in frogs similar to that of mammals? That's a very good question. Uh, I, I have to say I have no idea. I don't know, but because you said amphibians was one of the groups that you yeah, had not yeah. particularly so, so the thing is that, yeah. as, as I showed before in one of the in one of the slides, slides, uh, there are these three groups of amphibians. Frogs are one of them, and frogs are the only amphibians that don't have a tail, but they <laughs> they. they they develop a tail, the tadpoles have tails, and then these tails right. degenerate when the, yeah. the tadpole metamorphoses into an adult. So, right, so this is kind of like a very unique case for the frog. He's like yeah, a, an but, outlier. But in a salamander, for example, the salamander also moves around, like the main driver of forward movement is also the retraction of the femur. And this is also done by the gaudofemoralis muscle. But okay. since in amphibians, I like development is so different. I don't really know, and it's something that I would uh, be trying to study how this particular muscle, for example, is developing in an amphibian. If it develops uh, separated from other muscles and then it attaches to the tail, and what happens with frogs if the muscle develops in the tadpole and then degenerates, or what's going on there? I actually don't know, but it's like a very very Interesting right. Thing to, to so it's totally, but it's totally different than like with humans, right? Because like we just never develop a tail, whereas like yeah. these other ones, like they do, but then something happens. To the yeah, tail, so, so. something is going to happen. Like all the muscles of the tail in a tadpole are going to degenerate and disappear. Mm -hmm. So if there is something like the caudofemoralis muscle, it might disappear. If that muscle is not attaching to the tail, is uh, another story. And actually, in all mammals, even mammals that have a tail, the muscle that in reptiles would be pulling the, the leg backwards actually doesn't develop like that. And it's going to remain just within the limb. And yeah. all the muscles of the tail are, are, are other muscles that are not okay. related to limb muscles of reptiles. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Brian that says, did you learn anything about the ability of certain animals to regenerate their limbs? 
I think I think this is a thing in amphibians, yeah, or maybe sometimes yeah. in fish. Yeah, so this is also a very interesting question because amphibians are the only tetrapods that are capable of regenerating uh, structures. Salamanders are the best at it. Frogs are not very good. Frogs can regenerate, regenerate parts of their limbs when they are tadpoles, but once they metamorphose, they kind of lose that ability. And there are some frogs that cannot do it. But it might okay. be that the... the this particular way of developing limbs in amphibians allows them to do this. Because as I showed you in the first, in one of the first slides that they're in this chicken embryo that looks like a worm and has these somites. And from these somites, they develop and we develop vertebra and the ribs and the muscles of the body itself. And cells from these somites migrate into the limbs and they form the, the limb muscles. In an amphibian, like a salamander, when, when they are embryos, they develop a lot of things from the somites and they hatch and they move around. If you have seen like a little, early, very early, very young tadpole or, or salamander larvae, they don't have limbs. Okay. They are swimming around using their tail. They have developed vertebra. They have developed muscles of the yeah. body. They, they are using their mouths to eat in, in many cases, but the limbs have not developed yet. So. It's not really uh, understood what happens, what's the comparison between amphibians and amniotes because the, the structures that in an amniote give rise to the limb muscles or the limbs in, in an embryo, in mm -hmm. an amphibian, they have already disappeared. They gave rise to something else at the moment of limb development. Yeah. So maybe like one possibility is that some cells are just staying there, mm -hmm. waiting, and then they become, uh, they start developing limbs. Okay. And maybe this first uh, stage of limb development in amphibians is something that is similar to what we see in regeneration. So it might be that regeneration is like, actually is, it could be that the first development of the leg or the arm in a frog or a salamander is like more similar to regeneration than yeah. to the development of the limb of an amniote. For oh, okay. That is very weird. It needs more research. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. Um, I have one last question that we're going to take here um, from David. And he asked, um, are there ways of somehow exploring how um, the muscular of extinct animals um, for which we only have fossil specimens developed? Yeah, so a, a lot of people... Uh, uses fossils to try to reconstruct the, their soft anatomy, like what's not preserved in the bones. And in bones, you can see like in, even in, in, in modern bones or fossil bones, you can see places where the muscles were attaching. You can see some clues that are not 100% uh, perfect, like you cannot be completely sure, but there are very good correlates of if a muscle was attaching here, if a muscle was big or was small. And you can always compare with modern animals. Like if you have a dinosaur, you know that a dinosaur is more related to a bird and then to a crocodile and then to a lizard. So you can uh, see how the anatomy, the soft anatomy in all these animals looks like. And then you can start looking at the fossil and saying, okay, there is a big muscle here. Probably it is uh, this big muscle that we see in the bird or in the <laughs> crocodile or something like that. So yeah, there are these ways of reconstructing and understanding more how these muscles develop and how they, they change in these different groups also allows to kind of better, uh, to, to do this job better, to kind of be more capable of reconstructing the, the muscles of past animals, extinct animals, okay. if we know better the anatomy now. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're almost out of time here. Um, I just yeah, want to plug a couple of, no, 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 you're fine. We had some good questions come in and you had some good answers. Um, I just want to plug um, some information and links for people who enjoyed this talk. Um, we are having a, another speaker in this speaker series. Um, 
His name is Nicholas Mongiardino Coach, and he's an evolutionary biologist, um, also from the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department, who will be discussing the evolutionary history of sand dollars. And that talk is going to be on November 18th. Um, and if you all in the audience are interested in coming to more virtual events, um, please follow us on social media. The Peabody has a great social media presence, um, or you can sign up for the email list on the connect box in the homepage. Um, and we'd love to make sure you all know about um, other upcoming online programs that we have and are able to join us virtually together. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much again to Daniel for giving us our talk today. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to everyone who was able to make it. It was a 